But I want to take a moment to, in, to introduce you all to one of my absolute favorite people on the planet. So the gentleman, our special guest is Dr. Ray Wilhite. I've never met a uh, more keen in a collections, ability, a person that can find stuff. Uh, the holotype ultrasaurus specimen uh, was missing its transverse process and it was just gone. It, it had been there. We have pictures of it. We have illustrations of it. Heck, we had a cast of it. And Ray, like at two in the morning, it's on top of these 25 foot high shelves ro rooting around through boxes. And he's like, found it. What do you mean you found it? How'd you even know I was looking for it? And he comes down, this is what you're looking for? Uh, everywhere we've ever gone, Ray just has this eye in the collections. But he also was the first, if not the first, one of the first individuals to bring in 3D scanning into research. So he worked on his dissertation, uh, scanned a whole bunch of sauropod limbs. Ray is the, a, a, a limb expert. I mean, he knows the whole anatomy, but there's no one alive who knows more about sauropod limb bones than Dr. Wilhite. And uh, we dug at Dry Mesa Dinosaur Quarries. We spent a, a season digging up dinosaurs and Beyond that, he's, he works at Auburn. He teaches in the vet lab. He runs their lab. And when I visited him there, he handed me giraffe lungs. He just handed me this big, giant, puffy looking thing. He's like, what do you think this is? And they were giraffe lungs. I had no idea. I've got a, I've got a collection of all kinds of things here. Do you have the giraffe lungs near you? I do. I just have to show up. I mean, we've got Ray. It, it's... Grinning ear to ear. They were so gross and cool all at once. Because how often do you get to see the lungs of a giraffe? Yeah, they're huge. I think I've seen horse lungs. Horse lungs are gigantic. Well, I was going to say, this is a horse lung. Oh, wow. Oh, my giraffe. goodness. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's the back end. This is the front end. And this is a horse. Cool. Horse lungs to me are actually cooler than giraffe lungs. This is from a, so in this, the heart would be sitting right up there. So that's a, that's kind of the top of his back. Wow. Yeah, yeah I got all kind mm. of stuff in here. It's kind of, kind of my, my storage area and, and office, so. Are those replicas? No, those are real, so. Really? So we, um, they're made by, you, you, you blow fluid, uh, air with uh, formalin fumes in it through them and the formaldehyde fixes the, fixes the tissues and, oh, and basically, awesome. basically they, they're just like, uh, they feel just like styrofoam. That's awesome. So what yeah. do you think they were if you actually held them? We don't know when the avian style lung evolved and the avian lung is a flow through lung that doesn't expand and birds have tiny lungs relative to the size of their bodies. The lungs are really, really small relative to the, to the rest of their bodies because air just flows through them. They're not like a bellows, like mammal lungs. Were there small pterosaurs towards the end of the Cretaceous? I, I know we've been working, we worked on a pterosaur out of the Hell Creek formation. So the same formation you find T-Rex and Triceratops out of. Oh, and okay. it's got, the one we've got's got a wingspan, I think 27 inches. So it's, it's pretty little. So they were definitely, there were yeah. tiny ones. They don't preserve. The problem is there's just so, there's so many of them that are known from tiny fragments. I mean, yeah. remember, even, even the really big ones like Pteranodon, the bones are just, it's like Fragile, it's right? paper put together. You can find a pterosaur bone, but it, it, it's very rare that you find enough to tell what's there. And so I, they're, there are probably plenty of pterosaur species that we don't know anything about. Just like I suspect there are whole faunas of dinosaurs we don't know anything about. Think about your if dinosaurs lived in the mountains, how would they ever preserve? You're not gonna, they're not they, the only way to preserve something is in some sort of depositional environment. And you don't have that happen in the mountains, you know. So my guess is that there's there's a lot of uh a lot of same thing with pterosaurs, they're just so small and they get they get the fossils get beat up. Little mammals, mammals from the, if it weren't for teeth, we wouldn't know that 90% of the mammals in the Mesozoic even existed. And teeth are the hardest substance because they're made out of enamel. Well, a lot of pterosaurs don't have teeth. And even the ones that do have very nondescript teeth that look like, because they ate fish mostly. And so 
you know, I, it's there's no there's absolutely no reason not to suspect there were tons of small pterosaurs plying the skies and plucking plucking parasites off of dinosaurs like modern birds or anything. Yeah, that was a cool idea. That was something I wanted to uh, depict actually in a drawing because it was kind of different. I've never seen something like that before. I'm like, oh, I want to put little pterosaurs on the back of a big dinosaur. Jacob, you've okay. excavated uh, Pteranodon, correct? I've, I've dug up a lot of Pteranodon and a couple of Nyctosaurs. And we actually even found mixed in with one of our little Ceratopsians, we had some uh, pterosaur wing bones with that, that little unnamed uh, basal chasmosaur we did back in 2012 that was just kind of stirred up with it. But I've done a lot of Pteranodons and probably 90% of what you find are scrap wing bones. There's, I mean, I think in that case, a lot of it is because that's, all the good tasty bits were in the body. Um, but, and, and the, we're out in these oceanic deposits. So, so every time we find a pteranodon out there, it's just somebody who didn't make it all the way across the migration. Um, and so when, when those hit the water, everything in there would tear into them. So, so pteranodon, it's, it's uncommon. We'll probably find three or four a season and maybe 10% have a body and maybe 10% of those have a skull with them. So, and, and, and like Ray was saying that the bones, it's, it's sometimes when you're prepping it out, when you're cleaning the rock off of the bone, it's like cleaning rock off of a peanut skin and trying to keep it preserved. It's, it's <sighs> delicate work because I mean, they, they had to fly. So they, their bones had to be really, really lightly built. And, and so when they get crushed, when you find them, it's a, uh, it's not in great shape. Ter pterosaurs were not built to fossilize well, <laughs> give us lots of clues. they just, they just weren't. How do you think I've heard I've seen paleo art of like them blowing up bubbles. Like what would the purpose like, of that big nose hole have been? Well, I mean, so this is a not this is just a nasal opening, the nares. Um and dinosaur nares are kind of weird in that in that so so Larry Whitmer, not that not that many years ago, came up with this uh this concept called the rostral nostril hypothesis, which I really like. He, he showed that in virtually all extant vertebrates, the nostril, the actual opening to the nostrils is positioned out on the front of the nose. And so even though we see this big old opening here, um, probably Triceratops, the actual opening to the nostril itself would have only been out here in the front. Well, then in, in, uh, and in, in animals, you have a, you have what's called a nasal septum. The nasal septum is made out of, of cartilage and that cartilage separates the left and right halves of the nasal cavity and that would not be here in in this fossil so there would probably be a nasal septum here that would would actually divide a left and a right nasal cavity and then the the lateral the outside part of the nasal cavity at least in a lot of dinosaurs seems to have been made up by tissue and so if it's made up by tissue then it doesn't preserve and so when you when you end up with the fossilized animal, it looks like it looks like you got this gigantic hole here. But in reality, there was probably a system of of uh, what we call turbinates. Possibly, we don't really know that would have uh, fitted in this space. And you also would have had, of course, that central um, that certain nasal septum down the midline, and you probably would have had only a small opening out here in the front of the nostril. So I have thought for a long time that if you look at those big the big holes. What if they look like eyes, like on a moth? So he drew a T-Rex oh, yeah. and the T-Rex face is staring with that binocular vision. And he's got a ceratopsian staring right back at him, but it's giant eyes on the shield. So I have this crazy notion that it, so no one knows, first of all, there's no, no one knows for sure. But along the lines of those frills, there's two different groups of ceratopsians and the uh, the centrosaurines and the chasmosaurines. And the one group has a really tall, long eight frill. And then uh, and the other group has these beautiful, like Diablo ceratops. It's crazy. Yeah, the crazy, yeah, the frills. Frills. So the frills, like in triceratops, they're pretty thick and robust. But in some of these other ceratopsians, they're not all that thick and they have gigantic fenestra or windows in them. It would have made them light. It would have been covered in skin, maybe thermoregulatory. But when you see something like that, I'm thinking display along the lines of deer, you know, the uh, cervids today with all the different antlers and horns they have. So A, you know, oh, that's the same kind of ceratopsian as me, so I can go have kids with it. Uh, B, there's, I wouldn't be surprised if it was some kind of threat display or just display system overall. 
And the, the reports of them locking horns together, uh, there's been studies that show that, that some of the Ceratopsian skulls have scarring on the skulls at about the right height of where the competitor's horns would have locked in and pushed against one another. So they definitely tussled. Well, Hassan Farki et al. in 2009, this is showing where the wounds were at. And this is showing, these are showing healed wounds on the, on the sides of the faces of Ceratopsian, of uh, Triceratops. Awesome. And so we, we um, have An Andy Farky is going to be a guest uh, in May. He's going to be on, on our, on our group. So a couple Saturdays from now, we're going to have that gentleman who's a Ceratopsian expert. So we'll make sure to, to ask him and he'll wax eloquently on this topic. I'm sure. Here, I'll show you, cool. some, I'll, I'll show you something else too. So this is uh, just to show you what I'm talking about. This is a cross section of an alligator's face. Um, so this is about, this is about halfway through his snout. Okay, so that's his tongue right here. That's one lower jaw. That's the other lower jaw. This is the upper jaw here. And this is his nose. All right. So all of this stuff in here is inside that nasal cavity. Now, in, in alligators, of course, they've got this bony top over the nasal cavity. So they don't have the exposed nasal cavity like you saw in the ceratopsian. None of this would be preserved in the fossil record. None of this stuff here. This is all soft tissue. There's a nasal septum made out of cartilage. These are the kind of turbinates that, that line the inside of the nose. And, and uh, so there's blood vessels. This is a big vein here. So none of that stuff would be there. And so it would just be this giant open hole and you'd have no idea what was there. So this is what we're, Hodari was able to draw what I was thinking. If you look carefully, you can see the, the, the uh, ceratopsian on the left. And now, granted, it's likely not the case, but I really thought it was pretty cool. I, I articulated it, and that's what came out of his of the artist. He captured what I was thinking better than I could have ever even articulated it. I, I uh, don't know, but I, I don't see why not. Crazier things have happened, a la the hooded seal. The, the, the classic Hollywood triceratops, the biggest triceratops facing off with the biggest T-Rex is a classic in art and in Hollywood and everything else. But the reality of life is that T-Rex is not going to find the biggest, meanest triceratops and square off with it like a gunfighter in the old. And how often do you think that the big adults would have clashed? So First this is, this is a, the truth of the matter is we have no direct evidence that a T-Rex and a triceratops that was alive faced off with one another and fought a battle. Zero, none. There's no physical evidence in the fossil record. Wow. There's plenty of evidence that T-Rex ate Triceratops. There's, there's, there's pelvis of a Triceratops that had a chunk of it missing that a T-Rex ate. They're, they found fossil feces from Triceratops from T-Rex that has bone in it. But there's, there's no... So the, there's very few fossils that preserve that. So you've got, you've got like the... Uh, Oh, the Velociraptor and uh, and uh, Protoceratops oh, fossils that shows clearly that those two animals at one point fought with each other. The Protoceratops literally has the Velociraptor's arm in its mouth. I mean, that's one thing we can say for sure. Those two at least fought with each other. But so, uh, Jacob, but, what about the Triceratops pelvis that you guys dug up with the healing and the T. Rex bite marks on it? Uh, yeah, that was we dug up a triceratops in 2014 like the middle half of it um and there are bite marks in this one and uh heavy heavy infection that started it looks like moving throughout the the skeleton um and yeah there's there's not a whole lot of bite marks in it but that it's, it's it's pelvis got chewed on and we've got one vert with with one hole chunked into it um i want to i want to see this but uh but this this, this trike definitely didn't die immediately from that because because there was a little bit of healing on the bone and a whole lot of infection. We I mean the, the bones got really really infected. And this is that uh, this is that uh, T Rex I mean that pelvis from a Triceratops that's one of them that's clearly been eaten on by T Rex and there's tooth marks here and here puncture wounds here and then there's actual this section where they've been able to lay the teeth in to these grooves and 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 show pretty conclusively that it was a triceratops i mean a t-rex that did that t-rex knows if i just wait i can go pick off something easier something sick something smaller and the triceratops knows 
I don't want to fight this guy because I could possibly win, but I'm going to get hurt. And there's no nurse. There's no 911. So I think that cooler heads probably prevailed after the initial rawr. Unless, like we see at Dry Mesa, where you're in a drought, you're in a situation of prolonged starvation, and you do crazy things when you're hungry at that point. So maybe in, in those scenarios, but now you have two weakened in animals. So when we, we go through the what was T-Rex, uh, scavenger or hunter, and my answer to that is usually yes. Um, there's, 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 no <laughs> animal, there's no animal in nature that's truly only a scavenger, only a hunter, even even things like uh, vultures. Lions even scavenge. Like, and everything will scavenge. I mean, hey, if I can get my meal for free, that's way better than expending energy for it. I, I've grabbed pizza off a table before that I wasn't looking <laughs> for. The thing about T-Rex is when you look at the teeth of T-Rex, you know, they look like bananas. They don't look like, they don't look like steak knives. And so it's, it's very it, it makes a lot of sense that they're they're designed for taking big bites, eating lots of meat really fast. What I see them as as they come on a carcass, well, for the you know on an average day they come across a carcass, it's being eaten on by some smaller theropods, and they come up, and all the other theropods run away, and the other T Rexes are coming, and whoever the T-Rex finds it first has got to get his meal first. And he takes a few big bites and he eats two or 300 pounds of meat as fast as he can eat it. And then the other T-Rex has come and we know that they fought with each other. There's plenty of evidence for that. <laughs> We've got lots of T-Rex. T-Rexes have all kinds of facial scars and mangled limbs and or mangled, you know, ribs and stuff from fighting with each other. Cool. So we know that. Yeah. So they yeah. probably... One the, the biggest one probably kicked the, the smallest one off the carcass. And but but being big in that case allows you to to dominate that carcass and feed on it the longest. And so I see that as your average T-Rex. I bet small T-Rexes, young T-Rexes probably were active carnivores because they would have they would have been the smallest kids on the block when the but but uh, and eating smaller animals too. But I, I don't uh they weren't running 35 miles an hour chasing down hadrosaurs and rolling them over and things like that. That just, I don't buy that. It's just, they're, they're not built to do that. But they, if they wanted to, it, to your point of the answer is yes. When you're that big, you do what you want. If you walk up, you want to hunt something down, take it down. I mean, you know the risk because you've made it that long to be alive, but maybe just felt like Ceratopsian one day, want to take out. You decide to go get it himself. <laughs> You want to soup? Yeah. The, the giant olfactory bulbs in T Rex sort of point to the fact that it was, it, I'm sure it could smell a dead animal many, many, many miles away. And, and I, I don't, I just, I feel like they, I feel like they, I could see them following along with the herd, for instance. And, and as the animals in the herd die off, you know, oh, or, yeah. or is they're weak, you know, that maybe they got a, maybe they got a wound. And it got infected and they're weak. There's certainly no reason a T-Rex wouldn't walk up to something and finish it off. But I don't necessarily, I, I, I don't necessarily see them in the movies. They've always got to show T-Rex taking on the, the most, the, the strongest thing around. And that doesn't, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in a, in a modern, you know, from what we know of ecology and biology, that just doesn't make a whole lot. I don't know. I, I, I think I hurt the, the students are not happy when I get through talking about T-Rex. But. So in the UK, we say Diplodocus, but in America, you say Diplodocus, is it? So what one's right? <laughs> tomato, tomato. Yeah. I'm a Diplodocus guy myself. But I'm a Diplodocus Dipl guy. Jacob? Diplodocus I that. Clearly. <laughs> like I'm an aluminum guy, but you're an aluminium girl, I'm betting. Yeah. So yeah, part aluminium. of it is, these dinosaur names are taken from a dead language that no one speaks. So Latin, yeah. Diplodocus, Diplodocus. Uh, the one that kills me is, is, is it Camarasaurus or Camarasaurus? I use I, I, I literally use them both. Camarasaurus yeah. And Camarasaurus is my favorite creature on, on the planet. That's why not I did the it. prettiest creature on the planet, but my favorite. And so you would think I would know exactly how to say it, but I say it both ways. Camarasaurus or Camarasaurus. Really? This is actually from one of my, from my lecture, and I always include try to include the name, what it means, when it lived, and where it lived, so that students start to get some idea about those things. 
There it is. YPM 1920, the holotype specimen of Diplodocus longus, the very first Diplodocus named in uh, 1878, Charles Marsh. The problem is that at the time it was the first vertebra that they had found where it had the chevrons. Which uh, I was learning about the Apatosaurus, sonic booming tail. Use that, like, that's awesome. But what did, what did it do with that tail that could create a sonic boom? You've got those giant hips of a Diplodocus. They're just massive. And if you look at how a whip works, when you whip it forward, the energy is, the whip is very thick at the base. And so when you crack a whip, you have a massive amount of energy. And as the energy runs down the tip, the energy is getting in a smaller and smaller place. So when it comes out to the end of that whip, it cracks, and that's why you've got all of this energy that is channeled. If a, if a diplodocid with that really long tail put a big amount of horsepower into its, into its gigantic car-sized pelvis, that energy would go down the tail and become attenuated to the tip of the tail, which is basically your middle finger replicated 20 times. It's got these 20 or so long bones, and it would have been wrapped in, it would have been covered in tight scales. And so the thought is the very tip, if you gave it enough power, would have broken the speed of sound by virtue of the amount of energy that was put into the system. Now, why would they do that? And the concept is if they were going to fight with one another, possibly they could have just snapped tails at each other. Another thought is it could have been used to communicate long distance or to have been used to have been a defense, like it's a scare away, rather than hit an Allosaurus, because if you're gonna smack an animal with your tail, you may break your tail. Mechanically, it could happen. Did it actually happen? Who knows? You notice at the end of a tip of a whip, it's frayed. We don't find frayed bones or frayed scales. So there is some challenges with the hypothesis because when you generate that much power coming out the tip, it's going to cause some kind of, of impact to the bone. And we don't see that. But so what he's saying is no. <laughs> so what he's is no. That makes it makes that makes no sense because if I accelerate those little bones at the tip of my tail to the speed of sound, I'm going to break them into about a billion little pieces. It does not. It it is possible with math, considering the bones not made of bone. But once you put little, I told him I said, well, if you want to make it, put put little put little dowels in your whip out to the end that that mimic bone that have the same physical properties and see what happens to them and if you ever do get them to crack which actually i'm not sure you can because of the if you look at a bull whip i mean like he said the, the end of it's just the very tip of the of the whip that goes supersonic the rest of the whip does not but uh if you got it to crack my guess is that you would destroy those little dowels at the end of the at the at the end of your whip and so it is really interesting, and, and that broken tailbone would certainly impede you from bringing the end of your tail to the speed of sound anyway, and we find that that you find those broken caudals. I would think that, I would just think the whole tail would be of a series of broken caudals if they were actually whipping their tails at the speed of sound. Um, but, you know, it's a great, it, it, the imagery is awesome. It's just like the imagery of the T-Rex Start squaring off against the ultimate triceratops is awesome. It's just the reality that's hard. <laughs> it's hard to come up with. <laughs>